So we have never, never signed up with any food blogger. We have okay. never paid anybody mm -hmm. to blog about the place or post a reel or anything like that. It's been purely done Organic. organically. Yeah. And people are left to do whatever they want to do with it because I don't believe we should be paying uh, somebody to uh, post something to an extent where I feel like you, that person would be misled mm -hmm. because of making it seem overly attractive than it is. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd rather risk it for that little element of surprise mm -hmm. where somebody walks in and says it comes with this average expectations and is surprised mm -hmm. uh, by the food. I, I like to leave people with that kind of impression rather mm -hmm. want them to find out for themselves rather than base it on what somebody else is saying. So uh, we've had to contend with a lot of people that have said, man, I've heard so much about your place, uh, so popular, so many people are talking about it, blah, blah, blah. But my advice to those people is try it out for yourself because what works for me might not work for you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you can't use the same yardstick for everyone. Restaurants that we went to where there were restrictions about uh, you can't bring outside food, you can't bring pets, you can't bring a birthday cake from the outside, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't modify, you can't customize food, you can't do all of that stuff. We decided to basically do everything the opposite way. We wanted to allow, we allow pets, we allow people to bring birthday cakes, we've even allowed people to bring their own tiffin boxes mm -hmm. and come and eat in the restaurant, you know, mm -hmm. because there's two friends, there's a little story I had about uh, two people that walked in once mm -hmm. and uh, two college students and uh, one guy already had lunch mm -hmm. from home he brought his little tiffin box and the other guy was very keen he didn't bring his lunch but he was very keen on eating here mm -hmm. so uh, they took a chance and they asked me you know is it okay to if my friend eats his lunch on the table while i order something from the restaurant and we said okay mm -hmm. so a lot of people looking were very like how did you allow somebody to open his tiffin mm -hmm. box and start eating in the restaurant, you know? But that's exactly the essence of what we wanted to do. In our kind of place, why it's a little difficult to scale uh, very largely, is because everything you order off the menu is made to work. Okay. We don't have anything ready made. Okay. Uh, I think maximum I can give you is like a bag of chips. Or bread. Or, or bread. bread yeah. the untoasted bread, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Uh, but that's as far as it goes. We mm -hmm. don't have anything ready to eat. Mm -hmm. Everything has to be made okay. uh, as per uh, as per the menu. So mm -hmm. that process involves a lot of time, mm -hmm. a lot of care, and a lot of it is very dependent on the hand of the cook as well. Yeah, chefs. So, on the chefs, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, when you have that hands-on kind of model, mm -hmm. uh, it's very challenging to scale. Okay. Okay. Scale. So and we don't want to go the way where you know, people are just reheating stuff and sending it o over. It's not like a like a biryani uh, brand where mm -hmm. you know you make one big batch for the day and the batch gets served yes. from one dekshi. You know, ours is, cannot be like okay. that. Uh, it's not possible to do it mm -hmm. along those models. So that's why it's difficult for us to scale okay, yeah. scale that way. So that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So if somebody is priced at, at 200 rupees mm -hmm. in the restaurant, mm -hmm. uh, they will take a percentage of that 200 rupees that we are charging mm -hmm. as their commission. Mm -hmm. So some restaurants will have 20%, some people will have uh, maybe up to 32%, 33% commission. Mm -hmm. So the, the, uh, the aggregator will take the price of the item plus the GST mm -hmm. and they will take those two together and they will take the percentage from both of those put together. Oh, so, okay. So it's a cumulative mm -hmm. uh, total of the tax and the okay. menu price. So, but uh, I, I agree with you. There are restaurants that have priced it differently mm -hmm. simply because the commission level is so, so high, high that it makes no sense. To, I have a lot. I have a lot of friends uh, that have restaurants that basically go offline most of the time because mm -hmm. they say, "What's the use? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just banging out orders just for the heck of banging out orders. I'm mm -hmm. not really." Making, making anything up, yeah. on those orders. It's just, I'm just, I have the online presence and that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. But I'm not really taking anything home. Mm -hmm. You know, 5%, 6% is peanuts, you know, uh, we're doing the level of work uh, we should be yeah, doing to make those orders available to customers. So I feel it's important for us to maintain a good balance of both. Mm -hmm. Not just online orders, Dependent on but a dine-in because what we make in terms of our dine-in business is ours to mm -hmm. keep. You know, but with an aggregator, we're at the mercy of in terms of uh, what commissions they want, what overheads they want to include, in terms of what gateway charges, mm -hmm. what additional expenses they want. To. So 
we're giving away a lot more than we want to give to aggregators. Mm -hmm. But that's just how the market is positioned at the moment. Okay. And uh, so I think in order to maintain some sort of balance where you're not solely dependent on aggregators, mm -hmm. is that I think focus on your dine-in. Okay. Focus on your dine-in so that, you know, that this is just a supplement to what your main mm -hmm. uh, strength is. Mm -hmm. Is don't focus on the commercial success of it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just the way I see it. I, I think where a lot of people go wrong is that they focus on making money mm -hmm. first before actually focusing on the actual product mm -hmm. you know i think if your product is right the money will follow mm -hmm. it's just a natural progression of how things should work mm -hmm. you know uh, there is a simple experiment uh, that we have all seen and also been part of growing up in wherever we're from in india uh, is that we will know small places local places uh, that are known for their food mm -hmm. you know and no matter where they're located, no matter where they are set up, where how far it is, how difficult it is to get to it, we will find our way to that place. That becomes a landmark. To go and eat. Yeah. You see, that's how that's the power of food. You know, it's just we will find if it's yeah. if it's like ten kilometers away, we will find some way, hook or crook, to find our way to that place because that's the power of food. You will have once you decided to try that place. You will find your way to it and you will try that food. So I believe you, something that cannot be hidden is good food. Today I will be conversing with Nathan Lee Harris, founder of Hole in the Wall Restaurant. We will be discussing about how to start a restaurant business in Bangalore, how aggregators like Swiggy and Zomato made an impact on restaurants in India. If you find this video useful, leave a like and share with your friends and subscribe to this channel. I am Saravana Bhava, co-founder of TechIS Online Coding Bootcamp. If you are interested in learning web development, data science and chat GPT courses, I will leave link in the description. Please find it. Hi, Nate. Hi. Very beautiful place. I think you recently moved in. Yes, this, this is building. a new building. Yeah. Okay. Before we go into about hole in the wall and the business side of it, I want to know more a personal side of yourself yeah. and the story behind hole in the wall. Yeah. So. We started, I think, almost 15 years ago mm -hmm. uh, in a small garage. Uh, my wife and I started this. So, uh, and the whole objective behind it was uh, just to start a small neighborhood friendly kind of place which mm -hmm. uh, offered more home recipe based food. Uh, we didn't want to do the whole commercial kind of uh, food and we wanted to leave people with an impression that, uh, you know, the whole, you're getting food straight out of someone's kitchen. Mm -hmm. someone's home kitchen mm -hmm. so we started very very simple very humble uh, beginnings uh, we started with four tables uh, in a garage uh, 15 years ago um, and uh, yeah we grew from there so uh, basically customers were our biggest sounding board they were uh, our what do we say uh, our lab rats mm -hmm. so to say so we we built our whole menu based on the feedback we got from customers on what they wanted. So like from the up. beginning, was it English and Western uh, yeah. Uh, food? Yeah, yeah. So from when we started, we always wanted to start uh, a place that was different and unique. Okay. And back then in 2009, we didn't have uh, all day breakfast kind of places. You know, mm. you had Darshanis. Uh, if you wanted continental breakfast, most probably you'd have to go to like a five star hotel. Mm. Uh, or a top end restaurant that and mostly that will only be available during the weekends mm -hmm. and it'll also be priced very premium. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't easily available to everyone. So our goal back then was to make it affordable mm -hmm. for people so that they didn't have to wait for the weekends mm -hmm. uh, to try this kind of cuisine. Mm -hmm. They could come in any, uh, any, any day of the week and any time of the day mm -hmm. they could come in. So back then 2009 was the big call center boom. Mm -hmm. Everyone was into IT, ITES. People were doing working deep nights, so they were waking up at like six o'clock in the evening, seven o'clock in the evening, oh. uh, starting their shifts at about 10, 11 o'clock at night. So deep nights. So we figured, why not make breakfast available? Why do they have to skip that meal? Mm -hmm. uh, go start their day with dinner mm -hmm. when they can start their day with breakfast. breakfast uh, yeah. who's, uh, who's fixing the rules anyway? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what we did. And we made it available to uh, everyone at an affordable price. And uh, the other thing that we wanted to do was uh, 
not wait for an occasion uh, to have people try this food. Mm. We wanted people to uh, just wake up in the morning uh -huh. and if they were hungry and they felt like uh, continental breakfast uh -huh. or continental cuisine, mm. we wanted them to think of all in the world. So that's how we uh, started and that's how we grew. Um, also, some background is we never really advertised the place. Mm -hmm. It only grew by word of mouth. Mm -hmm. uh, so, if you knew about it, you would tell a friend, that friend would bring some more friends, those friends would tell more people. But that's how we grew, very organically. Mm -hmm. We never invested a single rupee in advertising. Yes, I think your restaurant is having 17,000 reviews on Google, right? Possibly, yeah. Yeah, so that itself is a huge marketing and we type the best breakfast in Bangalore maybe it tops the list your restaurant congratulations thank you for that but you said that you have done no marketing but no i marketing. think organic marketing the people have shown love towards yeah. holding yeah, the world for sure for sure and seventeen thousand reviews so that's very huge yeah. for any restaurant in bangalore yeah. so yeah. congratulations thank you that. so you started this business with your wife right? yes so tell us about it how was it starting a business with a spouse and growing as a couple how was the journey uh definitely challenging mm -hmm. that's for sure it's not not a walk in the park mm -hmm. and a lot of risk because both of us uh have jumped into the business together uh without any semblance of which way it's going to go whether it's going to we never planned it to be so big we never planned for it to be popular uh we just wanted it to be just a local neighborhood kind of uh restaurant that uh most people, only the locals will know about. Hence the name as well. So basically in the West, they refer to a lot of uh, these kind of places as hole in the wall kind of places because of its size. Mm -hmm. They're very small, little places, mm -hmm. uh, not much to look at in terms of decor and everything else. But the food is generally very soulful food. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you're eating home cooked food straight out there. Normally it's a mom and pop kind of joint mm -hmm. where a husband, wife team mm -hmm. or a family Mm -hmm. is uh, working to uh, uh, to service customers as well as bring out the food and uh, that's exactly what we wanted to be this simple uh, home cooked food that's all and uh, hence we chose the name because where we started was a tiny little place which is four tables mm -hmm. and uh, the rest they say is history so yeah we grew uh, slowly by slowly every day hard work every single day mm -hmm. and uh, this is where we are before hole in the wall, what were you and your wife? Oh. So my wife was uh, flying with Kingfisher Airlines. Uh, Air was, okay. Yeah, she was Air Hostess. Uh, I was working with Microsoft. Mm -hmm. uh, so both of us had very sort of unrelated jobs to what we're doing yes. right now. But uh, on the side and outside work, our passion was definitely around around food. And that's how we started the whole idea as well, because every time we would go out, uh, to dine or just to socialize, we would uh, end up talking about this imaginary place that if we were to start a place, what would be its unique points, what uh, the ambience would be like, what the food would be like, what we would do, what we wouldn't do, what we would allow, mm -hmm. what we wouldn't allow, all of that. So even with restaurants that we went to where there were restrictions about uh, you can't bring outside food, you can't bring pets, you can't bring a birthday cake from the outside. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't modify. You can't customize food. You can't do all of that stuff. We decided to basically do everything the opposite way. So we wanted to allow, we allow pets. We allow people to bring birthday cakes. We've even allowed people to bring their own tiffin boxes mm -hmm. and come and eat in the restaurant, you know, mm -hmm. because there's two friends. There's a little story I had about uh, two people that walked in once and mm -hmm. uh, two college students and uh, one guy already had lunch mm -hmm. from home he brought his little tiffin box and the other guy was very he didn't, he didn't bring his lunch but he was very keen on eating here mm -hmm. so uh, they took a chance and they asked me you know is it okay to if my friend eats his lunch on the table while i order something from the restaurant mm -hmm. and we said okay mm -hmm. so a lot of people looking were very like how did you allow somebody to open his tiffin mm -hmm. box and start eating in the restaurant you know mm -hmm. but that's exactly the essence of what we wanted to do Mm -hmm. We wanted to be a restaurant with a difference. We wanted to do, allow people to feel as comfortable as they want to feel doing what they wanted to do mm -hmm. in the restaurant. The space is yours mm -hmm. as much as it is mine. It's that that was the whole concept. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, that uh, 
we broke a lot of the norms <laughs> in terms of what at that time in 2009 what restaurants allowed what they didn't allow uh, and we just decided to, to do it our own way and I think people like that because uh, they just basically felt very at ease like when we started in 2009 it was a very very informal kind of restaurant it was just uh, more about uh, people just wanted to dine that's it. The focus was just, I want to eat. I'm mm. hungry, I want to eat. Mm. It wasn't about how I came dressed, how, uh, you know, how I, uh, uh, how I looked mm. to other people, how great the service was, how great the decor was, mm. all of that stuff. It, it didn't really matter mm -hmm. back then. So people walk in with their pajamas. Mm -hmm. People would, uh, there are few instances where it's quite clear, people hadn't even washed their face, brushed their teeth, just because rolled out of bed or into that. Sunday morning. But it was great because, you know, the vibe was so informal, you know, everyone was just so informal, everyone was at ease, nobody was competing with the other, you know, in terms of how everything looked and all of that. So, you know, so yeah, that's, so that's since those you are our beginnings. talking about interiors and decor, so I think you have very unique, uh, very vibrant interior. So you have a lot of books and you have a lot of these paintings across the board. Yeah. So, what is the inspiration behind it? So now if you if you look at a lot of restaurants now and even even 10 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, the norm was to make entertainment available through uh, television, you know, television, people screening matches, mm -hmm. uh, people watching their phones, watching matches on their phones, mm -hmm. watching videos on their phone. Basically, everything was very centered around technology. Mm -hmm. But what we wanted to do was we wanted to go backwards in time. Mm -hmm. We wanted to basically be a restaurant that was stuck, say, in the 90s, mm -hmm. where you didn't have the distraction of television, you have the distraction of mobile phones, you know, you didn't have the, you had live music, you had all of that stuff. So, very simple forms of entertainment. And uh, our main goal was to basically bring back conversation. Mm -hmm. So, people would talk to each other. The whole aim and objective of going and eating out as a family or as a couple or as friends was basically just to bond over food. Food was the little bonding element between two people uh, that would create that sort of experience for us to have a conversation, mm -hmm. share experiences, uh, have a generally nice conversation, mm -hmm. reminisce about old days if you're catching up with friends. Mm -hmm. With family, it was about laughing, joking, poking fun. There was, you know, we begin to see a lot less of that mm -hmm. in restaurants. So our goal was to basically remove all forms of technology which were distractions like yeah. televisions, big screens, yeah. all of that and just try to just reduce it back to what it originally was, what eating out was all about, mm -hmm. it was about bonding between people uh, or families. So, uh, hence we said let's bring in books, mm -hmm. you know, uh, if people wanted to sit, it's an art that's dying, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, not as many people are reading books these days as they used to. You know, everyone wants quick forms of uh, of entertainment. Everybody wants to watch a quick one hour movie. No, everyone now it's just 15 seconds. 15 Shots. seconds. Shorts. So, yeah. There you go. So, so I mean, everyone's attention span has come down so much, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that we wanted to kind of bring back the old form and the old ways of maybe reading a book, mm -hmm. having little book clubs, you know, just removing technology from the picture mm -hmm. and just having people do it the old school way. Mm -hmm. So, hence you see, that's why you see a lot of books, a lot of people get very excited looking at books. Uh, a lot of kids, we've even put little cassettes up on the walls mm -hmm. that my own kids didn't even know what a cassette mm -hmm. was. They didn't even know what a CD was. So, you still have tape recorders with cassettes? So, we have, we have the little cassettes, yeah. we have tape recorders also <laughs> around the place. So, I have to educate a lot of these kids yeah. these days of what a tape recorder is, what a uh, how the old technology, uh, how, how tapes were dubbed, how you should record, how you listen to the radio, yeah. all of that stuff. So we had brought that, try to bring back old forms so that we could expose the younger generation to it also. And then generally bring them back, understand how is it that they now have music on their phones? Yeah. How is it that they have it now at the press of a button and how it used to be. So they should understand the luxury, what they are enjoying, it, how it evolved. How it evolved, evolved, exactly, the evolution of it. So anyway, so that's what we do. That's Interesting. Yeah. So these books, all these books yours or personal books or you purchased for the store? For the some shop? of them, some of them are our own and a lot of it have uh, has been contributed by customers. Really? Yeah, a lot of okay. them have been like, you know, I've got like 
50 books lying in my attic. I haven't touched it in like 10 years. Mm -hmm. Please do something with it. Really? So about, make it available to everyone. Uh -huh. Let some, somebody may spot a book that they, you know, been looking for and haven't been able to, to buy, or, buy or anything. So, uh, also, uh, uh, a lot of people, even with the decor that you bring in as well, a lot of the decor also started that way, mm -hmm. where uh, people would bring their own prints of their own original art. Mm -hmm. And we would put up prints, put their little contact numbers at the bottom of the pictures so that people interested in art and wanted to buy or maybe explore uh, uh, different versions of somebody's art, which is get directly in touch with the artist. Mm -hmm. So we were just like a little billboard for people, little Basically advertising you are board. becoming like a platform for old that's, school artists. That's yeah. essentially yeah. it. So, you know, so so the, the whole bands come here too? Bands? We haven't started that yet mm -hmm. because of the space constraints and all the previous places. But now we're just waiting to settle into here and this floor that we're on, We'll actually yeah, start hosting. Yeah, we will start looks, hosting some unplugged uh, yeah. sessions. We've had conversations with a few musicians okay. uh, a few weeks ago mm -hmm. when we were, were screening that uh, Chandrayaan uh, yeah, uh, landing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were scre we screened it here mm -hmm. for for space enthusiasts. Mm -hmm. So uh, there we met a few musicians that were very interested in it, mm -hmm. and we just wanted to create this little jam circle of uh, musicians where you didn't have to perform exclusively. Mm -hmm. Like you know, I'm performing for one hour. It was just a circle of musicians where people could just pick up a guitar, somebody else could just pick up another guitar mm -hmm. and they could just jam mm -hmm. and just like conversation, jam over music, connect over music, Are create something. Are you trying to bring 1960s jazz era? Like, uh <laughs> Is that what you're I don't to know. I don't know. We're just trying to bring a community of people that mm -hmm. are so disconnected right now, despite the easy ways of connecting with each other. Yeah. They're still so disconnected with what each person can do mm -hmm. with each person's talents mm -hmm. that you want to create a little platform. It doesn't just have to be music. It could be dancers. It could be artists. It could be anyone. And we want to use the space positively mm -hmm. to encourage that. It's not just about, you know, the business angle of doing mm -hmm. it, but we have a lot of free space like now. Yeah at this time of the day, it's not really being used. So, so we can put, put it in use, yeah. make a platform for someone who, exactly. who so have real good talent. Exactly. Here. So we just wanted to make it available because I know how difficult it is uh, to hire a space, how expensive it can be to hire a space. Uh, when we have the space, why not make use of it? Yeah. Now coming to the business side of Hole in the Wall. Yeah. Now you've been successful. What is the future plans of Hole in the Wall? How are you scaling Hole in the Wall? So initially, we were very against scaling mm -hmm. uh, to more than one outlet uh, because we thought diluting the attention from one to a few more would definitely have an impact on the quality of food. And that uh, is absolutely possible. That's There's no lying about mm -hmm. that. So what we did was because of the, the overload of demand on one particular outlet, we then started branching out and we would open sister concerns around the place. So at the moment, we have three in Bangalore and one in Hyderabad. So there are, there, yeah, there are four outlets totally mm -hmm. that we have scaled to. Again, our goal is not, like I said, it's not, it's never been about the commercial success. Mm -hmm. We're not looking to become millionaires. Like McDonald's. No, or we're looking KFC. to become a massive MNC, mm -hmm. uh, you know, taking the brand Pan National. All the, mm -hmm. Although we, we have, had discussions with uh, potential investors. We have had uh, conversations around uh, maybe scaling it to that level, mm -hmm. uh, but didn't really seem uh, part of the soul of the place. You know, it's mm -hmm. not. It's very easy to go that way, okay. but it's very easy for it to slide also okay. the same way. Um, and I think we've put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears mm -hmm. into building up the brand, so it's it's gonna take. A lot of persuasion, a lot of convincing, and a lot of guts for us personally to take it to that kind of level, to take it to a pan national level. So we're taking little baby steps right mm -hmm. now, seeing how we can expand, how we can take it further without diluting the, uh, you know, the, taste the strength of the brand, you know, the, the quality of quality the, of everything, mm -hmm. you know. So that's how we've been growing right now, and we're at four outlets at the moment. And we have four outlets itself is quite a challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we have we have issues with quality, we have issue with uh, with supply chains, we have uh, issues with uh, with uh, manpower mm -hmm. uh, and labor, with government uh, licensing. Yeah, yes, and, uh, but 
is is it still challenging to, uh, for the licensing part? It uh, will depend area to area. Okay. Uh, it's state it, state it, governments. State governments will yeah. It, it, okay. It, it depends. But uh, I see. So I'm not comparing hole in the wall with uh, Burger King or uh, McDonald's. Mm. I want to uh, go with Indian outlet like social. Mm. Uh, look social at us. I, I'm looking social at a side because social was very popular in Mumbai and now it's becoming a pan Indian brand yeah. and yeah. they are doing pretty much a good job in terms of maintaining the quality because yeah. I, I had certain food in Mumbai. They are pretty much maintaining. So yeah. I compare hole in the wall because social have a vibe and hole in the wall also have a vibe yeah. very similar or mm, more earthy vibe yeah. right so yeah. i think is it it's still possible to expand pan, pan uh, india i think it, it i think it comes down to uh, what you're offering on your menu mm -hmm. um, see in our kind of place why it's a little difficult to scale uh, very largely is because everything you order off the menu is made to order okay we don't have anything ready made okay I think maximum I can give you is like a bag of chips or bread or, or bread, bread yeah. untoasted bread yeah. maybe. Yeah. Uh, but that's as far as it goes. We yeah. don't have anything ready to eat. Mm -hmm. Everything has to be made okay. uh, as per uh, as per the menu. So mm -hmm. that process involves a lot of time, mm -hmm. a lot of care, and a lot of it is very dependent on the hand of the cook as well. Yeah, chefs so, so on the chefs. Yeah. So uh, when you have that hands-on kind of model, uh -huh. uh, it's very challenging to scale. Okay. Okay. scale. So, and we don't want to go the way where, you know, people are just reheating stuff and sending it o over. It's not like a, like a biryani uh, a brand where, mm -hmm. you know, you make one big batch for the day and the batch gets served yes. from one dekshi. You know, ours is, cannot be like okay. that. Uh, it's not possible to do it mm -hmm. along those models. So, that's why it's difficult for us to scale, okay. yeah. scale that way. So, uh, again, like I said, like the, the manpower, uh, the the uh, getting qualified uh, cooks and chefs uh, are to be on the same wavelength in terms of how we run our businesses okay. is a big challenge, which kind of limits uh, how we can scale okay. and scale quickly. Yeah. How often do you uh, change menus or bring add bring add-ons? So a lot of our, we, we, we have a very dynamic kind of specials board where we keep experimenting. That's how we build our menu. We mm -hmm. basically keep putting stuff up on specials board, yeah. roll it out, see how much of it flies, we collect feedback from customers, see what they are doing, how to, you know, what can be tweaked a little further, what can be done a little better, etc. And then we tweak it and once we know that people are coming exclusively in for that particular yeah. dish, then we know it's worthy enough to be on the menu. Mm -hmm. So that's when we, once we build up a significant amount of those items, then we will rehash the menu, we will take out uh, dormant or very slow moving kind of items mm -hmm. and replace them with okay. something new. So the thing also is with it is that we, we're a restaurant that, that uh, is frequented by a lot of regulars. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, people won't even touch the menu. Yeah. They'll either look at the specials board or they will order their the what usual, the favorites, usual yeah. thing that they have, you know. So, uh, again, to, to, uh, to get them to try something new with that kind of crowd also, is a little difficult because people are not very experimental, not very adventurous mm -hmm. when it comes to stuff like that mm -hmm. because uh, they're too fixed on maybe like one dish. Exactly. Or they have their set thing because they've already thought of what they're going to eat before they even land up at the restaurant. That's why so how do you change somebody's uh, you know, perspective, perspective about yeah. eating? Because that's why biryani is ruling all over India. Uh, I think it's it's for a good good reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, or, it's rocking. Yeah. <laughs> biryani is uh, become and a national dish. Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting to see, uh, you know, how uh, how differently people think about different biryani mm. brands and exactly. about different styles. Yes. And within that 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 broad thing of biryani, also there's that so is many a segments of biryani. Still sub segments that is Hyderabad, Kolkata, uh, Audi, yeah. and Chennai, yeah. uh, Kerala, or Donne biryani in exactly. Karnataka. So biryani is uh, people are very very crazy. particular about what they order mm -hmm. also. So yeah, interesting. And but for us. Uh, as is broadly more or less, uh, you can't really unless you desify the whole thing and you yeah. know you you put in like some some Indian masala based kind mm -hmm. of stuff and all. Then it like it's like how uh, McDonald's, McDonald's uh, and KFC kind of Indianized yeah. uh, a lot of their food. Mm -hmm. So, but you don't us, want to take that part. I don't think we should. Sure, yeah, I don't think we should because I, I believe people are coming to uh, to us uh, for the for original, a change. original. 
western yeah they, they, maybe they, a lot of them a lot of at least people have had conversations with they said now i'm just tired of having like maybe at least dosa four five times a day mm-hmm. i want something different mm-hmm. you know I feel like something different that's why i come mm-hmm. you know once a week or twice a week okay it's for just for a change you know mm-hmm. like that but we have been able to inspire a lot of uh, other cafes a lot of other restaurants mm-hmm. that have uh, imitated and uh, copied and everything and they've basically done because it's tried and tested now so we've seen what we have works so a lot of uh, other uh, cafes are now offering the same kind of food uh, so we're happy to be part of that inspiration as well. mm-hmm. yeah. so bangalore is now becoming a hub for uh, startups as well as hub for restaurants i think there are a lot of uh, young young boys and girls who work in hyderabad chennai uh, kerala they're putting a lot of outlets in starting their first outlet in bangalore mm. because their key uh, reason to start in bangalore is people don't mind the cost of the food because back in our place if i have to sell this dosa at 20 rupees that's the max but here i can sell the same dosa at 80 rupees yeah. still people are standing queue on want to taste it, it. Yeah. because of this growing economy and startup culture is yeah. are very high in Bangalore. Uh, so how do you see this uh, cu- culture around Bangalore? Hoteliers are, uh, it's like an expedition. Everyone wants to start their first venture, and uh, food venture or hotel or restaurant in Bangalore. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think because Bangalore is a very cosmopolitan kind of city now. It's become uh, a mix, a very eclectic mix of of people from all over the country Mm -hmm. you know it's not just about uh south indians now you'll see a lot of people from north india you'll see a lot of people from northeast india Mm -hmm. you'll see a lot of people from the west mumbai side Mm -hmm. all of that so it's a nice mix of people i i can see that every day you know when when i meet people uh at the restaurant they're from all over the place you know Mm -hmm. uh we get a lot of touristy also indian touristy kind of crowd also that come in and you can just see how uh different and diverse the crowds are in Bangalore. So I think it's a good platform to start simply because you have a lot of people that uh, to experiment with. Mm -hmm. A lot of people that kind of see what the pulse of the restaurant is. You Mm -hmm. know, if you roll something out here, if it clicks here, Mm -hmm. it's probably going to click in In other cities as Mm -hmm. well. Because I think people are a little more broadly Mm open-minded about trying new things. And... uh, it's a it's a bubbling city it's a you know it's a little boiling pot that's mm-hmm. you know uh, very o- welcomes startup companies with sort of open arms mm-hmm. so to speak not just the food mm-hmm. in a lot of other industries Anything, as yeah. well a lot of other industries as well so uh, and i think it's important uh, if you're trying to get a national presence somewhere for you to have some presence in bangalore because mm-hmm. otherwise it'd just be weird if mm-hmm. you had skipped bangalore and gone to other cities mm-hmm. uh, i'm sure people would just turn around and say why well, why aren't you in Bangalore? Mm-hmm. People constantly be questioning that. Mm-hmm. So, so for these youngsters, what I, I won't say advice, uh, because advice have become a negative term. So, what thought or what idea that like you would like to share, like for anyone who would like to start a, a restaurant, want to get into restaurant business? I think uh, what I tell a lot of people that come to me. Uh, you know, for suggestions and, you know, for pointers uh, is don't focus on the commercial success of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's just the way I see it. I I think where a lot of people go wrong is that they focus on making money Mm -hmm. first before actually focusing on the actual product. Mm -hmm. You know, I think if your product is right, the money will follow. Mm -hmm. It's just a natural progression of how things work. Mm -hmm. You know, Uh, there is a simple experiment uh, that we have all seen and also been part of growing up in wherever we are from in India uh, is that we will know small places, local places uh, that are known for their food, Uh you know, and no matter where they're located, no matter where they are Uh set up, where, how far it is, how difficult it is to get to it. We will find our way to that place. That becomes a landmark. To go and eat. Yeah. See, that's how, that's the power of food. You know, mm-hmm. it's just, we will find if it's, yeah. if it's like 10 kilometers away, mm-hmm. we will find some way, hook or crook, to find our way to that place because mm-hmm. that's the power of food. You will have, once you've decided to try that place, 
you will find your way to it and you will try that food. So I believe you, something that cannot be hidden is good food. Mm -hmm. I think that's how we've grown over the years as well. Like I said, we've never advertised. Mm -hmm. So we left it to people to decide whether the food was worth traveling for or whether the food was worth trying out in the first place. Uh, and it started for us as a social experiment because uh, back then, the norm was going out Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Mm -hmm. And if you're a bachelor, you'd be out with office friends, you'll be out with different people. Mm -hmm. And the first thing you would do on a Monday morning when you go back to the office mm -hmm. is basically talk. Tell the stories, yeah. Where all you went, mm -hmm. what to try, don't waste your money going to this yeah. place, try this matcha, this place is awesome, this is awesome, that place is awesome. You know, there'll be. And if your friend said that place was awesome, mm -hmm. nine out of ten, you're going to find a way to go and try that yeah. out. Because that guy said, but if you read an advertisement in a oh. newspaper, you'd be like, I don't know, 50 yeah. 50, like, you know, this is a risk. Yeah. You know, uh, if I believe what's written in the mm -hmm. ad, uh, most in nine out of 10, it doesn't exactly. meet expectations, you know? Exactly. Yeah. So you started in 2009. You started in a very tough time. Maybe yeah. that's when the recession hit and companies or businesses uh, left Bangalore and they're moving back slowly. In. Yeah. Uh, back then, there was no awareness of internet. There was no delivery apps. There is no concept of cloud kitchen. You have to put an outlet. Yeah. Now, they have a lot of options. That is a cloud kitchen. You yeah. can basically they can experiment yeah. uh, with customers from a cloud kitchen and sell it on Swiggy or any uh, yeah. last mile delivery app using uh, this delivery company. Yeah. So now with these uh, luxuries, how do you see? Is it advantage for you? Like how do you see? Yes, uh, there is a internet have boom. Reviewers have come. We are doing podcasts. And there are multiple food reviewers, food bloggers. Yeah. Back then, food bloggers were there, but blogs, not many people were reading. But now, we scroll a lot of shots, people uh, post on Instagram. So, how do you see that? How is it added value to your business? I think it's, uh, it's, it's part and parcel of, uh, of, uh, of somebody's, uh, of, the, of the current generation. You know, they're exposed a lot. To, to, to the online platforms of Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all these places. Mm -hmm. uh, food bloggers, yeah, it's, it's uh, to an extent, I, 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 I agree to their role in, uh, in um, publicizing places or making people aware of what's available out there. Mm -hmm. uh, but one thing I don't, I, I don't support with, with, with that is, is basing your choice purely of what a food blogger says. Mm -hmm. So we have never, never signed up with any food blogger. We have okay. never paid anybody mm -hmm. to blog about the place or post a reel or anything like that. It's been purely done organically, organically yeah. and people are left to mm -hmm. do whatever they want to do with it because I don't believe we should be paying uh, somebody to uh, post something to an extent where I feel like you, that person would be misled mm -hmm. because of making it seem overly attractive than it is. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd rather risk it for that little element of surprise mm -hmm. where somebody walks in and says it comes with this average expectations and is surprised mm -hmm. uh, by the food. I, I like to leave people with that kind of impression rather mm -hmm. want them to find out for themselves rather than base it on what somebody else is saying. So. Uh, we've had to contend with a lot of people that have said, man, I've heard so much about your place. Uh, so popular. So many people are talking about it, blah, blah, blah. But my advice to those people is try it out for yourself. Because mm -hmm. what works for me might not work for you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you can't use the same yardstick for everyone mm -hmm. and for everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, I prefer that element. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe if people are, uh, you know, uh, enthused about uh about the menu in itself, because it's not a widespread kind of cuisine mm -hmm. yet. It's not uh, widely available uh, in a lot of restaurants. So a lot of people are still kind of getting used to this cuisine. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are still getting used to the names of dishes, names of, of uh, ingredients that mm -hmm. we use and stuff. So people are trying it out. Like there are a lot of people uh, that didn't know the difference between an omelette and a fried egg. Mm -hmm when we started out. So a lot of it has been sort of educating mm -hmm. uh, how a fried egg is different from a poached egg, how mm -hmm. a poached egg is different from scrambled eggs, mm -hmm. how 
you have different terms for how you cook sunny side, single up. Fry, sunny side up over easy all of that yeah. so it's still a an area of food that is still in the process of educating the its audience. customers yeah, yeah. so uh, so coming back to the food blogger thing mm -hmm. i think like we have grown organically i feel it's better to grow that way rather than mm -hmm. than do the the food no, blogger i'm not asking scene. for the paid marketing mm -hmm. so is it, i'm talking about organic food bloggers maybe yeah. some reviewers who just pass by take or yeah, may not be a million uh, subscribers or follower blogger could be some thousands of followers just posted on instagram Oh, I had a very good breakfast yeah. at Hole in the Wall and yeah. as a brunch. That can gain attention or followers organically, not by paid. Okay. Maybe they could. Uh, like, how has that impacted the business? Is definitely, it yeah. definitely. It's a, it's the it's the mode uh, in which we we get a lot of our information mm -hmm. these days. So social media platforms are uh, what we're all on, uh, what we're all browsing through most of our days anyway, uh, and it's uh, definitely the in thing right now. Mm -hmm. So. It has very positively uh, Impact. impacted us, mm -hmm. uh, and also negatively mm -hmm. as well by setting the wrong kind of expectations mm -hmm. as well for people. Uh, a lot of people will say uh, very overhyped, mm -hmm. you know. So it kind of is a little overhyped in what we uh, what what we what we the experience we had, mm -hmm. which I agree because that's the danger of uh, of somebody going out there and painting a rosier picture than it is. Mm -hmm. You know, but then who controls that and how can that be controlled? Mm. You can't. Yeah. So uh, you get a mix of negativity, you get okay. a mix of positive. For us, it's about doing a good job. Mm -hmm. For us, it's uh, setting our, uh, our heads mm -hmm. on what we uh, are set up to do mm -hmm. rather than, you know, uh, trying to overdo something that we are not supposed to be overdoing. Okay. Really, so. so how about this delivery application, Swiggy, Zomato, so these things. So definitely they were helping a lot of restaurants during COVID. Yeah. Of course, during COVID, they saved a lot of restaurants by making it available, make them function as an essential service. So, how, how do you think about uh, the delivery of apps, well, uh, their role? Well, initially, when we, we started as a brand, uh, we never parcel food. We used to refuse to parcel food simply because we believed that if you were to enjoy the food, it's better to have it right there, 10 seconds off the pan mm -hmm. on the table. Yeah, that's the best way to enjoy our kind of food. Mm -hmm. Putting it in a box, getting the food after 20 minutes, mm -hmm. it's going to kill the effect of, uh, of uh, how well that food can be consumed. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but push comes to shove, we had to, we had to bite the bullet, mm -hmm. take the bait. Mm -hmm. And also jump on board with uh, a lot of aggregator platforms because that's the norm now. People want that convenience okay. of getting food in their living rooms without traveling and mm -hmm. going through all the traffic mess, waiting outside for a table, mm -hmm. all of that stuff. So we had to do it. Uh, they have helped uh, the, for, help service mm -hmm. customers of ours that want the food made available to them at home. So we've had to do it. But our focus is mainly on the dine-in. Really. Dine yeah, our strength is the dine-in, not, okay. not the... Okay, my personal story with Hole in the Wall. Yeah. I first tried Hole in the Wall through Swiggy mm -hmm. du during COVID times. Yeah. So we were doing this night shift or doing this online thing, online education, edutech setting up. So we were working all night. So by 6 a.m. we were very hungry. For 7 a.m. We, we were hungry during COVID time. Hole in the Wall was available, listed on Swiggy. That's my first experience mm -hmm. with uh, Hole in the Wall. Yeah. So I had this English breakfast. So first time, so there is this uh, beans, yeah. like a sauce beans. Yeah. That is the sunny side up, that is this bread, yeah. hashed potatoes. Or, yeah. So that's my first experience. I didn't expect the package to be well. The package was well. So it had all the layouts yeah, for everything. everything. So I didn't, I, actually that was my, I didn't expect it. It was like, wow, because during COVID time, we were ready to eat whatever we get yeah, because yeah. we were desperate for food. food right? yeah. So that's the only scarcity. Yeah. So and we were hungry, working all night and yeah. we were, it's morning. And to expect a, such a beautiful package in the morning, yeah. it was a surprise for me. So that's my first experience with Hole in the Wall back in 2020. Yeah. So after the COVID uh, relaxation, in so that's when I visited where is this restaurant and 
I saw this uh, place and it was very beautiful. Then yeah. I had nature. Oh, that's why the packaging was so good or it was well thought of or convenient. It was yeah. convenient. Yeah. It was open, eat it, but still it was good. Yeah. yeah. But of course, having it in the dine, uh, it is uh, it is an experience yeah. as said, but it it fed me. That's uh, so that's why I was asking how this uh, platform aggregators of uh, selling online uh, delivery. So they are taking the food it, in a way. They are a platform, right? They are marketing. They are doing marketing because all I did was what was available at that time. So hole in the wall was available and it was listed and yeah. the menu was yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. So that way the aggregators came through, you know, uh -huh. for a lot of restaurants. Uh, during COVID, because mm -hmm. how else did we? How else were we able to uh, get food across to people? Yeah. You know, there were people uh, that would drive up to the restaurant and you know order it in a parcel box and then eat it in the car, mm -hmm. you know, simply because there is no they couldn't they couldn't get you the couldn't dine in it wasn't allowed right mm -hmm. so but uh, that way the aggregators I mean all of us were hundred percent dependent on them to cycle any sort of business cycle any orders out there with uh, customers and to still have that connection with customers, you know, mm. over that. A lot of people couldn't manage that and had to shut down because uh, it just didn't work out. Mm -hmm. you know? So, so, so how do you see their role in the future? What one of the founders of Swiggy told me uh, when they were starting out and their objective was to basically make home kitchens obsolete. Mm -hmm. uh, that was their goal. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're very far away from that goal simply because yeah. ask people uh, how many times they use their own kitchens, you know, uh, it's probably it, uh, pretty much less. Maybe yeah. people in 20s. Yeah, no chance. I don't think they no have no any chance. experience. Yeah. I was a bachelor. We had to cook. We mm -hmm. had to cook food. Uh, we had to make our own food. We had mm -hmm. to do all of that stuff. Uh, dining out was not uh, too much of an option mm -hmm. because it was an expensive ordeal. Um, but now, it's just a showpiece now in a lot of houses where people just maybe use it for heating or reheating and that's pretty much mm -hmm. it. So uh, if they're hitting that kind of goal and if they're coming through on that objective, then you can realize how dependent people are on the service that they okay. that they're offering. So uh, I think they're here to stay. I, I think uh, it's a it's a fad that uh, a lot of people have just gotten too hooked to and for that to change would take something probably more phenomenal uh, mm. in its setup to dislodge it from what from what it's uh, mm. what it's achieving right now so so we whether you like it or not whether you see the biggest restaurants the fanciest restaurants mm. in bangalore in fact even the leela palace mm -hmm. uh, itc all of them are all on on aggregated on platforms yes. now so you don't have an option because mm. uh, that's the order of the day it's just everyone is ordering from those platforms so you, if you want a piece of the pie, you have to get so on how board. How do you see these two companies, Duopoly, on food business in India? I think it's, if it's a duopoly, it's fine because uh, for competitive reasons, that's healthy mm -hmm. uh, to have both of them involved. But if it's a monopoly, then we're all in for yeah. trouble because yeah. then we just have to dance to whatever. Soon it could be a monopoly. Either of the company could take over Acquire, one. Yeah acquire and become yeah, monopoly yeah. so how, how dangerous is it if it's a more monopoly or if the food industry is controlled by two private companies who are just delivering the foods i think they should try and encourage for, for the sake of competition mm -hmm. they should try and um, encourage as many and there are many people who are trying to also get on board launch better facilities better rates better uh, offers for customers so dc yeah. So that's why ONDC DC have been launched. Yeah. So definitely that would help. Uh, maybe they they might ease this monopoly or duopoly by Swiggy or Zomato or any other commerce. We're all hoping so. Mm -hmm. We're all hoping so. Um, but I think for us as a as a community of people in India, mm -hmm. we get very very quickly hooked to brands. Mm -hmm. Like if we order from Swiggy, we order from Swiggy. Mm. We may not even order from Zomato. We order from Zomato, we won't order from Swiggy. Yeah. We're very brand conscious, mm -hmm. very brand loyal mm. as well. So when a new player comes in, takes a huge amount of uh, investment, a huge amount of marketing just to change this, the mindset the mindset of people to try something new. Mm -hmm. As a restaurant, you're willing to open your doors to whoever is willing to give you yeah. a better deal. Because 
commissions are high mm -hmm. um, the cost of uh, of uh, following through on that service is also high for mm -hmm. the restaurant and it's a it's a huge cut off in terms of your profit margin uh, that you give away every month you know to an aggregator so for us we're always looking for better deals mm -hmm. on how we can be part of the online delivery experience but at the same time do it at a more probably economical mm -hmm. Uh, price. price yeah yeah so how do you see since you talked about aggregators and their economics so how much it has drastically changed over the years because you have been doing business before swiggy or zomato you have been doing business with swiggy and zomato post covid yes. so how do you see their approach towards restaurants from the beginning right now like how the commissions work how their economics have changed um I, they have they have adjusted it's changed quite drastically from when it when when it started uh, in terms of commission levels in terms of services available in terms of offers made available to customers they're obviously a lot more dynamic now uh they're obviously everyone is spoiled for choice there is hundreds of restaurants mm -hmm. you know to choose from um so i think in terms of making it user friendly for a customer that's there mm -hmm. Uh, so many options available mm. for a restaurant they have come through in terms of making it easier uh for restaurants to to to, uh, to make their food available to customers uh they do come in with ideas marketing ideas in order to make your food a little more attractive to customers uh they come up with ideas in terms of how you can increase the basket size mm -hmm. of what somebody is ordering if it's from 500 bucks how can you take it to 600 bucks mm -hmm. you know what else can you add what else can you complement people with what else can you supplement what you're already doing etc so that way they 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 have the data mm -hmm. to give them insights into what people are looking for mm -hmm. uh, what people want and then they share that data with restaurants as well because from where we're sitting it's very difficult to tell what a customer wants sitting at home mm -hmm. you know um <clears throat> so from that way they do include because it's mutually beneficial mm -hmm. not just to them but to us as well mm -hmm. yeah. okay so now they have data is a new goal <clears throat> these companies have millions and millions of data every day yeah so will this determine the future of restaurant business in the in absolutely yeah it is uh whoever has the data is king mm -hmm. this is as simple as that okay. so since uh, the aggregators have all the the data uh, uh, they're obviously going to dictate which way the wind blows yes so so as a hotelier as a restaurant owner how which is why that? which is why in my opinion i feel it's important for us to maintain a good balance of both mm -hmm. not just online orders dependent on restaurant but a dine in because mm -hmm. what we make in terms of our dine in business is ours to mm -hmm. keep you know but with an aggregator we're at the mercy of in terms of uh, what commissions they want what overheads they want to include mm -hmm. in terms of what gateway charges mm -hmm. what additional expenses they want to so we're giving away a lot more than we want to give to aggregators mm -hmm. but that's just how the market is positioned at the moment okay. and uh, so i think in order to maintain some sort of balance where you're not solely dependent on aggregators mm -hmm. is that i think focus on your dining okay focus on your dining so that you know that this is just a supplement to what your main mm -hmm. uh, strength is mm -hmm. you know so one more question with revolving the same so there has been a complaint or there has been a, a lot of complaints raised against hotels or a platform because the cost of the food which is available in the restaurant uh, and the cost of the food which is available on the platform there is a difference it's slightly high you hike the price or do you also lose for example if the cost of a food is 200 at restaurant and you quote at 250 at uh, any aggregator platform of course it has delivery charge the commission of the uh, platform and also do you make profit or do you sacrifice the profit of the dine in and uh, are you selling at 180 to the aggregator at the moment we have fair pricing so whatever you see on the dine in menu is what's offered uh online 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 we we, we okay. don't in fact there was a parity uh, clause with the online uh, aggregators where we couldn't have differential pricing mm -hmm. it had to match okay so if you're seeing something a little bit more online my guess is because 
the online aggregator has added some sort of convenience charges, delivery, charge. delivery charges, all those extra overheads mm -hmm. which they've added on, uh, which where why you'll see there's a difference. For us, it's just the menu price and five percent GST. That's pretty much all we all we do. We don't. Okay, we don't so do you don't pay any platform fee or uh, to any other commission to platform? No, so that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So if somebody is priced at, at 200 rupees mm -hmm. in the restaurant, mm -hmm. uh, they will take a percentage of that 200 rupees that we are charging mm -hmm. as their commission. Mm -hmm. So some restaurants will have 20%, some people will have uh, maybe up to 32%, 33% commission. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the aggregator will take the price of the item plus the GST mm -hmm. and they will take those two mm -hmm. together and they will take the percentage from both of those put oh, together. So okay. So it's a cumulative mm -hmm. uh, total of the tax and the okay, price, yeah. menu price. So, but uh, I, I agree with you. There are restaurants that have priced it differently mm -hmm. simply because the commission level is so, so high, high that it makes no sense to. I have a I have a lot of friends uh, that have restaurants that basically go offline most of the time because mm -hmm. they say, "What's the use? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just banging out orders just for the heck of banging out orders. I'm mm -hmm. not really." Making, making anything yeah. on those orders it's just i'm this i have online presence and that's pretty much it mm -hmm. but i'm not really taking anything home mm -hmm. you know five percent six percent is peanuts you know uh we're doing the level of work uh we should we are we're doing mm -hmm. to make those orders available to customers so hopefully like you said you experienced our food first yeah, online. online maybe that that from a marketing angle point of view somebody would have tasted online liked it and said hey i gotta go oh, see what else they've got yeah. Yeah. maybe try the dine in maybe Try something different, you know. Uh, that's the hope we have with mm. being on on an aggregator. So that's a pros and cons of being uh, with an aggregator. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. we obviously want to drive people to walk into the restaurant mm. uh, as opposed to just sitting at home and ordering. But then there's also a group of people that are happy just sitting at home. Yeah, can't be bothered going through all the traffic yeah. and everything. There are a lot of people working from home as yeah. well. So you know, whenever they're lunchtime they just want to pick up the phone order and it's there yeah you know it's, it's convenient, convenient. Yeah, it's convenient. Exactly. so that's it but no we don't have any differential pricing okay uh, online now are you incurring loss because of aggregators no fortunately not mm -hmm. uh, we uh, no we're not, not undergoing any loss uh, no no not as a business uh -huh. uh, per product sale are you incurring loss for that product if you sell a product as a diner no. No. and you sell on online no. whatever you make from uh dine you make more mm -hmm. do you make more whatever you sell from 100 percent from yeah from the dine in 100 percent of mm -hmm. the value of the, the order value is us mm -hmm. you know apart from the the tax amount 100 mm -hmm. percent of the uh, thing is ours mm -hmm. you know we we will pay our, our tax eventually on on that but down you the line aggregator you're not facing the loss for that particular no, order. we wouldn't sell an item okay. if, uh, if it doesn't if work it, your economy if it doesn't give you anything yeah. you know there are a few items on the menu that max to max probably break even mm -hmm. there's no loss no profit mm -hmm. on it it's just made available simply because people want mm -hmm. want it available so we have a few items like that on the menu uh, which are online uh, don't really make business sense to do but it's there because people want it but the majority of our items, no, we wouldn't be selling them if we were making a loss mm -hmm. on them. No. So, are you a foodie? Yes, sir. I believe anybody, <laughs> anybody that eats food is a foodie. <laughs> yeah. So, what's your favorite food? I think I like... I don't know, bias, but anyway, I, I, I think I like Goan cuisine. Goan cuisine. So go on prawn curry with the coconut Absolutely. rice. All of that's that. all my of that. favorite too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I love I love seafood. Yeah, yeah. I love seafood. I think because we've grown up with a lot of continental food. Uh -huh. uh, we've grown up. My wife and I have both uh, grown up with this kind of food. That you know, it's not really always on the top of our list. You know, that's of our favorites. But mm. we like to go out and try Mangalorean food, Mangalorean coastal mm. food, uh, seafood, uh, go in cuisine. Uh, we love probably if it if, if it was made more available. I love Thai food. Thai food. Yeah, I love Thai. My wife and I love Southeast Asia. As they're probably the only places we travel to outside mm. India. Mm. It either has to be Vietnam, Thailand, or Malaysia, mm. any of those. Because simply only only for the food. Food. Okay. So, what's your favorite restaurant in Bangalore? I don't have a favorite restaurant in Bangalore. You love. I, I, I have I have a bunch. 
a bunch of them that I go to, but no, not a not a favorite. We don't have a favorite favorite restaurant. Okay, okay, based on the restaurant. What's yours? Are, What's yours? My restaurant is uh, Shivaji Milchi. Ah, uh, Jayanagar. Yeah. So yeah. I, actually, my question was about that. Yeah. And you asked what's your favorite <laughs> Shivaji Milri because I'm a biryani because I've never tried a, a Donni style biryani yeah. before coming to Bangalore. Yeah. So after coming to Bangalore, I experienced yeah. it yeah. and it was mind blowing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think Shivaji is a very uh, it has a lot of heritage, right? Yeah. But my question is about that. It's a restaurant. It had a dining experience probably back in sixties or seventies. Yeah. Like a fine dine back in sixties and seventies, yeah. but now it's fading. It's fading off. It's the legacy is the fading off. But still, there is a demand uh, because of social media and other uh, reasons. People go to the restaurant, but I don't find the experience. I don't have a, I don't have a very good experience. So, this is the case of some of the uh, restaurant which have heritage, maybe passed on down generation to generation. They run the business, they just exist, but mm, they were not uh, providing the experience yeah. what they envisioned yeah. when they, they started, yeah. right? Yeah. So with that, how do you see, because you have very beautiful vision of, of Hole in the Wall. God bless Hole in the Wall should be like uh, McDonald's and KFC. That's how I see it. Any mm -hmm. business should compete against the West yeah. and have to win over the West. Mm -hmm. That's my um, opinion yeah. but uh, how do you see that in the future of 50 years down the line all in the wall <laughs> because you're creating an experience right you have a very beautiful vision you have put in a lot of effort yeah. uh, everything and you're trying to create this culture what do you see uh, well, for the us future? for yeah. us it's 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 about for us it's about baby steps really it's about uh, what what's happening today we wouldn't have envisioned what is happening today, 15 years ago. Uh -huh. You know, our idea of uh, restaurant growth was very different when we started, and that today it's very different. Like mm -hmm. the business goals are very, very, very different. Uh, for us, we're not pressured by the need to grow exponentially. Yeah, we're not pressured by that yeah. uh, because for us, it's not really about the commercial success mm -hmm. of it. For us, it's about because we are passionate about what we mm -hmm. do. You know, we we're here. A lot of restaurant owners you won't find them in their own restaurants mm -hmm. you know but we're here every day mm -hmm. we're working alongside the cooks with customers we're, we're in the kitchen working yeah. with the cooks Chef, yeah. yeah we're outside clearing people's tables mm -hmm. we're still doing that 15 mm -hmm. years on we're still doing all of that stuff and it's not really about because we're control freaks or anything like that mm -hmm. but it's mainly because this is our baby this is what we sacrificed a lot of personal time to do mm -hmm. and we are still sacrificing a lot of mm -hmm. personal time to do so for us, uh, the easiest thing for us to do would be to pull in uh, investors. There are a dime a dozen, all ready to, to, to jump onto the bandwagon. Uh, but no, that would just be the easier way out. And it will be the fastest way for a brand to decline, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I just feel because everything there is all about balance sheets. Everything is about spreadsheets. Everything is about numbers, 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 Profits, numbers, numbers. Yeah. I have friends who, 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 whose restaurants have gone that way mm -hmm. and not really loving it really there's, there's no soul to it anymore mm -hmm. and i don't think my wife or i could be part of something that you know has no soul that has mm -hmm. it's just being done for the heck of of, of uh, commercial success mm -hmm. i don't think that's the yardstick we use to do what we want to do i think putting a smile on somebody's face is worth a lot more mm -hmm. uh to my wife and me uh when people come and say wow it's it's so different you know this we had such a lovely time and you know that that keeps us going mm -hmm. you know that gives us the energy to come back the next day try even harder than we did mm -hmm. the previous day you know mm -hmm. we have a lot of uh, upsetting things uh, every day uh, for various reasons but you know we're human as well and it's just the little happy experiences that keep us going and have kept us going over the last 15 years so mm -hmm. uh, I think just gauging all those things over the years, I think we're more cut out to run our restaurant more out of passion rather than, you know, Commercial a size. business, yeah. make building a business uh -huh. empire. Uh, I don't know whether that's our cup of tea, mm -hmm. really, okay. so to speak, because we're still having fun. The day we, we stop, 
having fun with the restaurant maybe at that point in time we'll make it somebody else's problem mm -hmm. you know rather than waste our time mm -hmm. uh, you know sacrificing a whole lot just for the heck of money or mm -hmm. wealth or whatever mm -hmm. you know so i think we're good simple hearted people mm -hmm. we we've come from very humble beginnings mm -hmm. we're still very simple at heart we, mm -hmm. we don't have uh, very wide ranging high sky reaching ambitions mm -hmm. in life because we didn't start the business with those ambitions mm -hmm. we started because we wanted to put good food on the table mm -hmm. we wanted to put affordable food on the table and we once wanted it to be fair mm -hmm. fair about doing mm -hmm. it that's it sounds great so we want what what would be somebody's second home you know i want to yeah. feel at home people come here for various reasons not just for food mm -hmm. people want to come and read Peace a book mind, yeah. yeah people just want to come read a book they come up here they don't know anything they come up here bring a book sit here the whole day read what's the problem with that mm -hmm. what's the problem with that you get a people that want to have like a college little project mm -hmm. a couple of college kids will say it's looking for a space to have a little round table mm -hmm. discussion so you have your the catering space available them. use it mm -hmm. why not you know so it becomes part of people have, we've had people who been in school who are in college uh and now 60s. on the cusp of getting married we have people who walked in as a single people shared a table with somebody uh, with, with somebody else mm -hmm. they ended up dating married now they have kids you know they've met here just by chance out for the first time mm -hmm. and you know so we've had many many experience we have people coming here on the way to the hospital to deliver a baby mm -hmm. you know lady's already in labor but she says no i need to have food here first before i go to the restaurant so lady is literally wobbling mm -hmm. <laughs> it's an all english breakfast straight to manipal hospital for yeah. the delivery i mean we had so many experience amazing experiences for why people walk through these doors okay. you know it's not just about food and we want to keep the experience the same mm -hmm. you are an authentic we, yeah. it's it's these little stories that we live for mm -hmm. really it's not uh, about uh, mm -hmm. uh, the balance sheet or the or the or the sales report at the end of the day for us it's about little things it's about mm -hmm. little little experiences little things that that made a difference in somebody's somebody's day that's that's pretty much sounds, what keeps us going every day yeah sounds beautiful yeah. actually so with that note i would like to conclude our podcast for the day you have been amazing thank you i appreciate your vision and um, your you. love for food and making people have a beautiful time while having food so i truly appreciate i wish all the very best for thank you hole in the wall people who watch this video will definitely love to experience the food at hole in the wall as well so all the thank very you. best for thank you so much for speaking to me very happy to share yeah. thank you all the best for your podcast thank you so much yeah